you, thank you for coming. I will talk to you about my project. It's, it's about preserving, the idea is about preserving the experiences and lives of people, people who play, and we are all players, but not, uh, we are not the same. So, <clears throat> when I was thinking about the approach uh, I was taking to do the, uh, the interviews uh, for my documentary project, that's the Gamer Inside, I, was, uh, I thought that the best uh, word to describe it was kind of the, the word humanistic. Because um, what I do in my interviews is talk with people in different, uh, from different countries, from different ages, about <clears throat> their own experiences and their own lives. And the process of evol evolu evolution they follow, uh, the challenges in their lives, some of them are related to games, some of them not. But in the end, they are all related. So it's, it's more talking about the human values behind games, behind people who play them and that properly, technically, or uh, yeah, the development of games. Because this is, this is already being preserved. I mean, lot of, lots of books out there about game development. So Now we have uh, plenty of sources about preservation. We have uh, all these uh, internet resources, that we can uh, go out there and find all kind of data about the games that are being produced now. And uh, yeah, plenty of uh, places talking about games, about uh, all kinds of, of versions for every, every platform, uh, associations, events, talking about uh, all the process of, uh, and, and people to, uh, that are developing games. But what happens with the people who play them? plays the games? What is a game without a player? That was the question I was, I started to wonder uh, when I was like uh, six months or three months doing interviews only by, because I wanted to, I wanted to listen to the, to the gamers stories, nothing more. But everything came about uh, the moment when I was interviewing a guy who is an expert in cinema and video games and he told me, you know what, I'm noticing now that I'm feeling like uh, I'm a witness of, of uh, um, a historical moment, like the people who uh, saw the first uh, movie, uh, the Lumiere Brothers, or when Elvis was playing, or uh, the Cover Club with the Beatles. No, I, I, I really feel like I, I'm part of something big. I'm part of something that uh, is the growing of a new medium of expression. So that in that moment, I, I started to look deep into what were the foundations of my work? And yeah, behind every one of us, there is, there is a, a, a player, somebody who needs challenges. And the thing is that games uh, used to be a closed product. But now, in this era we are now with the, with the internet and social networks, they are more about a collective contribution. So even the proper game uh, assets and, and uh, uh, the universe of the game is made by the players in, in a lot of cases. So it's even more important not uh, to, to document, to preserve why they are doing this and you know the, the motivations and, and the lives of these people that in the end they are the clients, they are the, the real producers in this indie era. So this was the first motivation. And, and then there was the, this other universe of people who doesn't understand games at all. People that could be here sitting down and, uh, in this event and they don't come because they, they are games. And games have this connotation of something that is kind of childish and uh, nonsense. I don't understand games, I don't want to. I don't want to use them. So uh, I wanted to also to document how they are being used to teach, to express artistically, and uh, also the proper game developers, the challenges of today. So are the lessons that they have to take tomorrow, I think. So why, if we can document it now, why not to do it? Uh, perhaps because it's not commercial, but I think it, it's worth it. Because uh, in, in the end, tomorrow, somebody will put the real value and re really will learn from this. 
And then I was preparing this talk, looking uh, deeper into my work, into my motivation, and then I found a talk that was the talk I had here. Uh, it was a talk uh, that started uh, was in past PAX East in 2011 about game preservation. And we have here people from Joystick, the magazine, from the Library of Congress, the uh, people from the Smithsonian who work for the Smithsonian Museum doing the curation of the art of video games. And I find that moment. I don't know if you will understand it because uh, the, the sound is, like, is from the, the conference. Uh, it's not playing. Oh, yeah. I, sorry. Yeah. I, This guy is Chris Melisino, is the curator of the... a guy uh, who was uh, talking about the games he played and he's talking uh, he's telling him that uh, he remembered the guy remembered the persons who play with uh, how exactly was the game when he played the game and everything that was around the game so he has the, his own version of what what uh, the road he took was in the game and the experience he had in the game was so this is something that is called the third voice in video games. Uh, this, this guy, Chris Melisinos, uh, said that uh, we have three voices to preserve, to, to really uh, keep the essence and, and save it for the future in, in a game. That's the proper game, the author, and the player. Because as I told, yeah, the player is the one who decides what your game is going to be used for. Perhaps your game is going to be used to provoke a feeling of fulfillment, but perhaps not. Perhaps your player wants to mod your game or wants to use it in another way. So it's trying to give, uh, to listen to them. I think that's, that's, uh, that's the point. So this is the, uh, the third voice of video games. That's, uh, he insisted that the third, the third voice is critical to games as an artistic medium. When you are 12, you have no control over anything in your life, except perhaps for the choices you make in a game. So, in the end, is to document the, the, the key is to document also the player, not only the game. And there are a lot of challenges, a lot of troubles in, in, in preservation of, uh, of games. But what are the troubles I'm finding the challenges I'm finding in preserving gamers. First of all, it's a weird idea. The, pro the, the, the proof uh, is that uh, some people has left as I was continuing the speech. So it's a weird idea. What what this guy is doing? You know, uh, even my family something sometimes they think they think why are you interviewing so many people? Why? Uh, but I think the first ones who have to understand how important is their work are the game companies. If you check out Gamma Sutra, you will find an article. It's called "Where Game Goes, Goes to Sleep." Uh, this article uh, is uh, tells about what game companies do with their old assets, their old art, their old products. And the, the guy from Gamma Sutra went, uh, like, uh, sent questions to a lot of companies and it came out that some companies like Namco or other companies really didn't care about the original uh, materials of their own games. And they were 
found lost in, in, in drawers, in offices uh, that somebody bought, you know, like in an auction or something, and they found, like, oh, this is the Super Mario Brothers draft for the arcade, the original arcade, oh, uh, I think this is, belongs to someone. So, yeah, the source code, design documents, all of this has to be preserved. But also, the gamers and their creations, what happens? What happens with the, with what people is doing in games in games like Minecraft? Is this worth to be preserved? So basically, it's uh, it's about archiving and curating information. Uh, and well, here games uh, gamers are hard. I mean, we are talking about a very. Uh, it's my own view of gamers. What Chris said in this talk was, okay, let, tell people to go and tell their stories uh, to the museums, and then record that. Do you think this will work? I particularly think that you will end up having a ton of videos like you have on YouTube, for example. But I think it's better if each one of us curates his own collective memory around you. You know what I mean? If you go to your friends, if you go to your parents, if you go to your... I mean, this will work better because you know the persons you are talking with. And you know what could be more or less important. Yeah, so... So basically, it's about uh, getting people to tell you honestly what they think about the games and what they think about uh, the evolution of the media. So, well, uh, this is a lot of stuff I had uh, planned, but basically, uh, we, as we have only five minutes, I want to um, tell you, basically, this is going to be kind of a uh, video Wikipedia, but based on video game players and non-video game players, only gamers. The gamer inside figures are these ones. I started this project in December 2010, 315 interviewees from 21 countries between 5 and 19 years old and this is the data base uh, of 500 hours I have and yeah and we are w working on a video curation platform that will not be only useful for games we will be useful for any kind of video content yeah so this, this, those are the uses Historical uses, educational, researching, psychologist, uh, any kind of uh, human-based science can use this project. And thanks. And there is one last thing I had prepared for for today. Uh, perhaps you you will be able to see it, but not to hear it uh, in in uh, one of the monitors. And that's uh, one video. Uh, that I recorded uh, from four uh, developers, from indie developers, so you, you can have an idea of what the project is like, uh, what kind of testimonies they, they gave me or they, they, they explained to me. Uh, I, first of all, I want to apologize because there is one part uh, of the video that it goes really slow because I tried to do a 3D effect and, and the machine was not too good to render it, but uh, it will work out.